Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. It's been a wild week for the Assembly of First Nations. Just last Friday, the AFN Executive Committee and National Board of Directors voted to suspend National Chief Roseanne Archibald effective immediately. The AFN also said an investigation was underway into four complaints against Archibald. The National Chief says those are attempts to silence her and she is calling for a forensic audit of the AFN. For more, we are joined now by National Chief Roseanne Archibald. National Chief Archibald, thank you so much for joining us. You know, earlier this week, uh, you had provided the AFN with a series of demands that if not met, you saying you would, uh, would proceed with legal action. Among them, what you were asking was for them to confirm that your suspension had been done without proper authority and that you'd be allowed to continue doing your duties. Have those demands been met? Well, first of all, my, my legal team, I think that was an oversight on my part. I don't make demands, I make reasonable requests. Mm. And I believe that the, the legal letter speaks for itself. It does show that they broke the rules under the charter in trying to suspend me. And so we are now uh, waiting for the response from the Assembly of First Nations uh, regional chiefs, mm -hmm. who I understand are meeting right now. So it, it'll be interesting to see what their reply will be but one thing that i did want to say you know melissa i've been doing this for 33 years uh i've previous to the afn there's never been a single complaint zero complaints about me and i've always my whole career people who know me in ontario and even across canada will tell you that I built my career on transparency, accountability, honesty, and truth. And this pattern that I've experienced at the AFN of launching HR investigations, I really hope people see it. They see that there is a real toxic pattern in the organization. And that's really why I'm asking for an independent investigation into the AFN mm -hmm. to look at where these toxic patterns are sitting in the organization. How do we clean them out and how do we heal them? And that's what I'm, that's what's in my heart and mind, you know, having to go through this as the first woman national chief is, is really difficult. I mean, I know that these roads that I have made uh, inroads into as a leader and all the five glass ceilings that I have broken in my career, I've always known that those would be difficult processes to have people accept the change in leadership, accept how women do lead and, uh, you know, move forward in a good way with women in leadership. But what's happening to me right now is just really, it's, it's so toxic. It's such lateral violence. It's such misogyny. Uh, it's it's so based in this corporate patriarchal system mm -hmm. that the AFN Secretariat is built upon. And so, you know, as I go through this, I'm thinking about all the women out there who are watching. You know, all of the the young women, especially um, the women who have gone before me in leadership i'm thinking about them i'm thinking about all the girls behind me who will walk into spaces that other women and myself have opened up for them mm -hmm. and what i'm hoping is that people uh, is particularly the regional chiefs start to realize that their political attacks on me and this you know coup that's happened is really detrimental to the people it's detrimental to girls and women watching this unfold across canada you know are you involved in this investigation in any way i mean we know it's taking place they're saying but what's what's your involvement in it uh, well melissa the hr investigation is uh something that i you know i can't comment on yeah. because it is a legal process but what i can tell you is what led up to the investigation and again it has to do with my my transparency and accountability when it comes to funding that is meant to help our first nations and so what happened was in early may i received a request for a million dollar plus payout for staff and I refused to do it. I felt it was wrong. I felt it was unethical. I felt like, you know, these are public funds that we receive in order to 
help our people and for me to just hand that off to others just you know just uh, staff didn't feel right and so what happened was when I sent that to the CEO the AFN CEO to let them know what their rights were uh, should they leave the organization that's when everything went sideways that's when all of this started and suddenly you know um, the there were four staff involved um, and uh, you know I still don't know the details I have not mm -hmm. received anything in writing I don't know anything about this investigation but what I can tell you is that I am participating because you know that I fought so hard for resolution 13 to make the AFN a safe place for women and 2SL people and you know I got into a lot of hot water when I spoke out against um, the pushback against that resolution I spoke out in favor of it I called out the national chief of the day and shortly after that uh, this first investigation was launched. So it seems like there's a pattern here that every time I call for accountability, when I call for change, when I call for positive change, I call for us to look into and investigate things, some kind of HR investigation is launched. Like there's a really unhealthy toxic pattern and we have to clean it up. That's just a little bit of what she had to say. You can watch that entire 13-minute conversation with National Chief Roseanne Archibald on our website, aptnnews.ca. We want to hear what you think about the upheaval currently going on at AFN, all of the allegations being leveled at Roseanne Archibald. Here's how you can share your thoughts. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see all of our latest stories. The Canadian press is reporting that a Manitoba judge ruled the province failed to properly consult First Nations communities as part of a major flood prevention in part as part of a major flood prevention project. It's in an area that has suffered devastating floods over the past decade. A couple hours north of Winnipeg, the $600 million project proposes two channels be built to drain high water from Lake Manitoba and Lake St. Martin into the larger Lake Winnipeg. The Lake St. Martin area was severely flooded in 2011, forcing thousands from their homes, including band members in four communities, some of whom spent several years in hotels or apartments scattered around the province waiting for homes to be rebuilt. This court ruling said First Nations weren't consulted in a meaningful way about the clear to be done for these channels. Federal environmental regulators in Ottawa have not greenlit the proposal and question whether the Manitoba government has done enough to address First Nations concerns. $90 million was awarded to First Nations people in Lake St. Martin, Dauphin River, Little Saskatchewan and Penamatang First Nations back in 2018 for the 2011 flood. We have to take a short break, but still ahead, a Northern Ontario MPP takes his oath of office in a much different way. Stay with us. Ontario's sole Indigenous member, member of Provincial Parliament was sworn in yesterday along with all other MPPs and part of the ceremony involves an oath to the Queen of Britain's royal family, something incumbent MP for Kuwait and takes some issue with. I, Salma solemnly affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The night before that ceremony, Mamakwa took to Twitter to say, quote, I have to pledge allegiance to the royal family to become a member of the provincial parliament in Ontario. It's so colonial. What would you do if you were Anishinaabe? While he made the oath to the queen holding an eagle feather, he went on to speak in Ojikri and then made an oath of his own. I pledge allegiance to them. all my relationships. He's a member of the Kingfisher Nation, and this is his second term as MPP for the mostly Indigenous Northern Ontario riding. Well, a two-day summit celebrating matriarchs wrapped up today in Winnipeg. It featured 200 Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited and gender-diverse people. Artists, authors, political representatives, and many more from coast to coast gathered. The two days were aimed at celebrating the strength and leadership of Indigenous matriarchs while sharing stories and applauding each other's achievements.
This was a desire to bring us all together, to center our excellence as Indigenous women, to uh, be inspired by one another, to be empowered by one another, to spend two days connecting with one another, and just really, you know, centering joy. You know, often when Indigenous women gather, it's around our trauma and it's around our victimhood. This is the opposite of that. Like, we're celebrating Indigenous women's creativity and, and you know, all of the amazing things that we do. Now to northern Quebec, where a long-running logging dispute may be coming to an end. The Atikamekw Council of Manawan approved recommendations from Quebec's forestry industry after they published a report about illegal cuts on the Dubé family's maple grove, around four hours north of Montreal. Amelia Fournier visited the blockade that has been in place for four months. Il y avait des sorties de, de bois par là. Ça a été enlevé. On avait mis un, un genre de barrage, puis ils l'ont enlevé. Annette Zubé and her sister are patrolling the road that leads to their family's maple grove to make sure there hasn't been any new forestry activity. The forestry ministry's report concluded what the Zubé family already knew. It determined the forestry ministry and the CID Saint-Michel, the company that cut through the maple grove, were at fault. They had failed to their obligation to consult Encore une fois, la, la, la famille puis le, le chef de territoire. So it recommended to directly include community members in forestry activities and to review the consultation process, but no penalties were given. Mais c'est sûr que ça a été très décevant pour la famille. On, on, on nous a présenté le rapport en mi-dernier, fin mi-dernier, puis euh, ça a été très décevant de savoir que il n'y a rien, il n'y a aucune pénalité qui a été euh, émise envers la compagnie forestière, mais envers aussi le, le ministère. The Ciri Saint-Michel emailed the map of the route that cuts through the Dubé Maple Grove with Manawan's Territorial Resource Department twice. The Forestry Ministry didn't wait for a response from Manawan before approving the company's plans. Glenn Zubé, an elected councillor in Manawan, says it's not the first incident. Les, les compagnies a, a, arrivent dans nos communautés avec des permis de coupe déjà octroyés. Donc, il euh, y, y a une distorsion entre ce que le gouvernement entend quand ils sont dans leur bureau et ce qui se fait sur le terrain. APTN visited the Dubé family and their supporters at the Manawan blockade in March. People from neighboring communities and from as far as Montreal came to show support. Back in May, the president of Ciudad Saint-Michel said that he was hoping to start logging again in Manawan territory by June 6. But the Atsikamek at this camp say that that won't happen until their demands have been met. C.B. Flama, the vice chief of Manawan, said Atsikamek consent needs to be integrated into the forestry industry. Améliorer davantage sur l'approche de consultation euh, axée sur le consentement préalable libre et éclairé. C'est important parce que le territoire, ça nous appartient, puis euh, on doit prendre position aussi sur tout ce qui se passe sur nos territoires, par exemple sur les coupes forestières, comment les territoires devraient être réaménagés. Despite remaining tensions, the relationship between Manawan, the Forestry Ministry and Ciri Saint-Michel seems to be improving. C'est un pas vers l'avant, je pense, de, de reconnaître une erreur. Là, la prochaine étape, ben, c'est de, de, de réparer. Neither the CID Saint-Michel nor Quebec's Forestry Ministry responded to APTN's interview request. The blockade might become a permanent fixture to make sure the maple grove is protected. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Manawan, Quebec. We have to take another short break, but when we come back, a 700-kilometer race in the Yukon brings out hundreds of paddlers, including one team called Every Child Matters. That's coming up. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Our very own Bruce Spence, line producer for APTN National News, captured this picture what he referred to as a murder of crows planning their next caper in the north end of Winnipeg. Be careful, Bruce, you need to remember that crows remember faces. If you have a photo that you would like to share, you can email it to share at aptn.ca. Let's take a look at tomorrow's weather. 25 in showers for St. John's, 19 and some rain expected for Halifax. The Grand River makes a sending cloud in 10 degrees in Nukshuak. You may even get some flurries in 7 degrees. Shibugamu showers in 23. Sedales 15 and showers. Lots of sun for southern Ontario at 28 in Ottawa, 26 in Sault Ste. Marie. 
Cap is casing, showers in 23, Big Trout Lake, 20 degrees and mostly sunny. 18s for Puckatawaga and God's Lake and Thompson, you might get some rain. 29 and showers for Winnipeg, 27 and showers for Brandon. 17 and sunny for Saskatoon, Regina looking at 24 with sunshine there. 17 for Buffalo Narrows and rain, 23 for Uranium City and Stony Rapids, sunny skies for both of those places. 24 and sunny for high level Fort Chip, 22 and sunny skies. 12 and showers for Calgary, 18 for Edmonton, showers expected there. Sun for BC though, Bella Coola, 28, 29 for Penticton. 24 and sunny for Prince George, Deast Lake, showers, 23 degrees. Whitehorse, 24 with a chance of rain, 23 and sunny for Beaver Creek. 24 and sunshine for YT, Fort Simpson, 21 and showers. Fort McPherson, 18 and cloudy skies there. Tuck, 11 and sunny. Whale Cove, 14 and sunny skies. Same with you in Arviat. Kenite, 12 and sunny. Tallyoke, 12. You're sunny too. A major paddling race on the Yukon River is in full swing. Over 100 teams from across Canada and the world have descended upon the Yukon to participate. As Sarah Connors tells us, there's one team close to home that is racing with an important message. So I cut from there to there. Is that the big banner? Yeah. So we're As Vantad Gwichin First Nation member Pauline Frost gets ready to paddle the Yukon River, she thinks of her grandmother, Clara. She traveled south on this same river when she was taken from her home in Old Crow, Yukon, and sent to residential school. So if you can only imagine the, the anxiety, the fear, all of it as a young child being you know, taken away from your, your parents and your way of life and your culture and your all new surroundings with no love, no support, no, none of it. Today, that river is the route of the Yukon River Quest, a 715-kilometer race from Whitehorse to Dawson City. Over 100 teams from across Canada and around the world will paddle the exhausting three-day race. With the team name of Every Child Matters, the women hope to raise awareness about the children who never made it back home. I look at the river as, as you know, has a story, and the story has to be told and this is an opportunity to just say this is not just about the Yukon River Quest. This is not, not just about a bunch of people jumping in their canoes and racing to Dawson. Being that we're Indigenous and it's close to our hearts, we feel strongly about it. Alice Frost is Pauline's daughter. Growing up, she had little exposure to First Nations history in school. She hopes her team's message will keep the conversation going. So I just hope that it kind of gets people to stop and, you know, learn about what happened and, like, educate themselves and know that, like, people are still hurting. The team has been preparing for the journey for two months. They'll paddle the first 24 hours without sleep, with only two rest stops until they reach Dawson City. Between the hours of like 3 a.m. to 7 a.m., that's when it really becomes like a mental battle. After a while, your body kind of just goes numb, and it's all a mental game from there. Pauline agrees, but says it's the younger generation like her daughter that motivate her to spread the message. This is all about the future. It's about their story. And it's about them writing their story and sharing their story and what it means to them. And they're off. After making a mad dash to their canoe, they're on their way. It's a race to the finish on a river with a dark legacy, but one that this team hopes they can bring to the light. I hope that everyone contributes in some small way to healing and to breaking the, the, the compound trauma and effects from residential school and that collectively as a community we can start working towards a better future for our young people. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse.
that paddle from Whitehorse to Dawson City is on my bucket list. Well, with June being Pride Month, APTN's Chris Stewart profiles Chevy Rabbit. She is a Cree trans person living in Edmonton who's been an advocate for Indigenous issues and the LGBTQ community. When people started being hateful, I thought, well, it's, it's not me. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm like, I'm, I know I'm loved. I'm a good person. I do good things. A decade ago, Chevy Rabbit was a victim of a hate crime. She was assaulted and robbed. It left her traumatized. She decided to try to stop violence towards the LGBTQ plus community. And she created the Hate to Hope rally. The rally attracts hundreds each year to promote peace instead of hate. Chevy Rabbit became a needed voice. I became an advocate here in the city when I got gay bashed and I never thought I would become an advocate. I never thought I'd have to use my voice to help others and not only that, help entire communities. So I think it's been an interesting journey, a journey, a healing process, a self-discovery, all tied into, intertwined into one. She says many people over the years have told her she has helped them in difficult times. I would say a lot of men and a lot of LGBT men, no, no matter their culture, background, or um, uh, our ethnicity, I would say a lot of men in the city and a lot of men in the province uh, who are closeted because they're too scared to come out. It's not safe yet for them. And I would say a lot of trans folks have come in advocating. I think a lot of, lot of trans folks, um, despite whether you're Indigenous or not, need people to speak on their behalf. I seen on Facebook earlier Rabbit says it's been an honor representing people. She meets with local and provincial governments to offer a path forward for the LGBTQ plus community and the indigenous community. To advocate for people who are marginalized, people without a voice, people who are struggling, because I can say from a bird's eye view looking in the entire LGBTQ from an indigenous lens um, is going through um, active trauma. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I think the work that I'm doing is really meaningful and impactful. In 2017, she was recognized in Avenue Edmonton Magazine as a top 40 under 40 in the city. Rabbit also co-created the Walk a Mile in a Ribbon Skirt event in 2020. The event brings awareness of the importance and cultural significance of the Ribbon Skirt. She now works as a reporter for the Alberta Native News and says being an advocate has been fulfilling and it's also been challenging. So I think it's scary at times because you don't want to let people down because you can see a lot of people who need help. You can see whole families who are, are learning inclusivity, they're learning pronouns, they're learning get, to give dignity and space to people who otherwise would be a pariah. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Well, that is it for your Friday edition of APTN National News. You can always catch up on anything you may have missed on our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great weekend.